Um, okay, so I'll get straight into the paper. Um, belonging and alienation in the contemporary university. So much is made in contemporary higher education parlance of the university as a place of belonging. From the foregrounding of clubs and societies to the signposting of study hubs and student unions, student life has always been conceptualized as a time of togetherness, affiliation, connection and kinship. A quick glance at any university website underscores this ideal. The home pages of Trinity College and University College Dublin reference a vibrant campus life amidst a suite of community building activities. The universities of York and Bristol boast a safe and inclusive campus environment where diverse student bodies can thrive and belong. Maastricht University highlights the importance of being together in times of corona, while the University of Leiden aspires to an inspiring community of students and staff from almost all corners of the world. The university in these senses is much more than an abstract ideal. It is a concrete space where the energy of real life places and rituals is paramount. Indeed, the sense that a person is doing something with others as part of a broader experience that stretches and unites across time and space has always been fundamental to the university as institution. From rituals of arrival, like matriculation formalities and welcoming events, to rituals of departure. So in graduation ceremonies at Trinity College Dublin, for example, undergraduate students proceed from the dining hall to the exam hall to, st to symbolize the change from graduand to graduate. Um, it is long established also that students actually living on campus thrive both academically and socially. One can easily see how the safety and security provided by university accommodation provides a welcome breathing space from the accountabilities of adult life. Joshua Forstenzer has written compellingly in this context of undergraduate residential education as an opportunity for transformation and metamorphosis. This period of life is fraught with fragility and peril as well as promise and excitement, he writes. It is this acceleration of novel and often emotionally charged and challenging experiences without the establishment sorry, without the establishment of a firm sense of routine and expectations or a clear mental vision of a time where the sense of the quotidian will emerge, which leaves an imprint on the memories of former students as pointing back to a kind of time out of time when thinking of their undergraduate years. As Forstenzer points out, these are the halcyon days of university life. They are rooted in place and time and in the vital experiences of formative human connection. The signature importance of place in university life is explored also by Norgard and Bengston, who argue that the university should develop not only people, but places that care. Places that offer sanctuary and inclusion and that invite embodied practices of dwelling. Universities should allow for the creativity and playfulness of their staff and students, they argue, and they should champion the same flexibility in their design of physical space. Ultimately, for Norgard and Bengston, the entire architecture of universities, to include classrooms, lecture theatres, libraries, canteens, lounge, lounge areas and hallways, should be reimagined in ways that reflect the university as a physical force as a place that might be owned, occupied and lived in by its current community, in their words. When we speak of the university as a place, and not merely a space, we speak of it as a place where people, with, Heide with Heidegger's term, dwell. It is not an empty container to be filled with the conceptual spirit or concrete flesh of the people occupying these spaces. The university itself is a force of being, and by dwelling there we become absorbed into this being. Accordingly, the university is not just a space we occupy in a specific time span during the day, while we teach or attend classes, continue our research projects and maintain and develop the infrastructure of our department or faculty. Rather, the university becomes part of our broader life world. Of course, given the unprecedented impacts of COVID-19, the signature importance of place in the broader life worlds of young people has become ever more apparent. Following the closure of campus facilities in 2020 and 2021, universities across the globe were soon to acknowledge this, that the student experience was much broader than that captured by formal imperatives of teaching and learning. All were immediately concerned to foreground institutional values of group membership 
and social engagement and held in common across the board beyond the usual claims to world excellence in research and scholarship were aspirations towards community and connection a recognition of the very human need to be part of something greater than the individual alone. In the Irish context, the widest possible return of students to campus was quickly prioritised by the Minister for Further and Higher Education, who pledged the acceleration of the youth vaccination programme as well as the development of rapid testing procedures as additional safety measures. By mid-2021, even with still existing public health restrictions, it was widely accepted that vital social aspects of college life had been missed out on by first and second year undergraduates in particular, and that a full return to face-to-face on-site teaching was paramount. However, for all the importance of the placeful university, one which invites togetherness and connection, it is just as likely, unfortunately, for the student experience to be one of loneliness and detachment, of alienation even. The university experience can foster belonging in the loveliest sense that it can develop affinities and friendships between like-minded people, but it can also disrupt it. Certain identity factors such as social class, disability, race, etc., etc., may encourage a sense of fitting in for some, but not for others. And in order to explore further these related ideas of belonging and alienation, I want to look at two literary texts. The first is the short story, uh, Abortion, a Love Story, from Show Them a Good Time, a collection of short stories published in 2019 by Nicole Flattery. And the second is Normal People, a 2018 novel by Sally Rooney. My apologies here to Emma, to Paul, to Richard and to Leila, who had to listen to me talk about normal people at a different event only a month ago. I promise I'll read a new book soon, <laughs> but I'm still working on normal people. Um, so both of these texts fit loosely into the genre of what's sometimes called, only semi-ironically, the Trinity novel. These are texts in contemporary Irish fiction, many of them written by young women, which involve a university setting, more specifically still, the university sitting of Trinity College Dublin, and usually a central female character navigating all the academic and social challenges of undergraduate life. Beyond the work of Rooney and Flattery, other works that loosely fit this description include Belinda McKeown's Tender and Louise Nealon's Snowflake. Abortion, a love story, centres around two female students, Natasha and Lucy, who come together in the second half of the story to stage a play. Both characters are deeply alienated from their university context. For Natasha, she wasn't even fully sure how she ended up in the college, which was separated from the outside world by large and forbidding gates, an oasis in an uncaring city. She remembered reading through the college brochures and picking the place with the oldest, leafiest trees, the highest buildings. This was where she would get most value for money, she decided. As for classes, she attended one here and there, but now she was in final year, she realised you were supposed to go to many classes, one after another. For Lucy, similarly, college life is regarded with equal parts disgust and detachment. I believe I've been sent to this college as a punishment for something I did in a past life, she said, as she gnawed at a piece of chicken. That's the only way to explain it. In Flattery's text, as Dervila Houston argues, the idea of the elite university is employed ironically. Natasha chooses the university from a brochure, picking the place with the oldest, leafiest trees, the highest buildings, where she would get the most value for money. Yet, once she arrives, she cannot perform her expected role in the college. In fact, it is mentioned several times that Natasha no longer knew what she was studying. Later, when asked how she feels about the college, she admits a deep sense of present unease mixed in with a singular dread for her future. She feels like she is in the process of losing a long and complicated bet, one that will carry on for several years, where I will end up down a huge amount of money. So what picture of the university then are we given in Flattery's story? Is it, in the terms of my opening slide, a vibrant, inspiring, inclusive and welcoming space where community building activities allow a diverse student body to be together and to, try, to, to thrive and to belong? Well, no, not exactly. The university, as Natasha and Lucy experience it, is alienating, intimidating and threatening. Its faculty are intellectually spent and morally bankrupt. 
Its student body are focused either on the maintenance or the achievement of status, on the gain of material and social capital, on endless professionalising and on the securing of high paid employment. There is little conceptual space for the university as a place of revolution, of self-creation or the widening of social solidarities. I'm thinking here in particular of Richard Rorty's idea that the university should actively distract students from their struggle to get into a high paying profession. College students badly need to find themselves in a place in which people are not ordered to a purpose, writes Rorty, in which loose cannons are free to roll about. He idealizes, he idealizes further of the potentially erotic relationship between teacher and student, where love of inspirational literary texts is the basis for profound growth and transformation, writes Rorty. The sparks that leap back and forth between teacher and student, connecting them in a relationship that has little to do with socialization, but much to do with self-creation, are the principal means by which the institutions of a liberal society get changed. All of this is mercilessly parodied in Flattery's text, of course, where any potentially erotic relationship between teacher and student is debased to a predatory and patronizing affair between Natasha and Professor Carr. It is hard to find any ideal of the university that might be achievable for Natasha and Lucy. As the critic Dervila Houston writes, Flattery's story resists the valorization or nostalgia of youth and discourses of elitism and specialness which underpin meritocracy, specifically by, by skewering these very concepts through the two students at its centre, Natasha and Lucy, who in many ways are failures within the university system. I turn now to another campus or university novel, To Normal People by Sally Rooney, and I open with two quotations from that text. This is what it's like in Dublin. All Connell's classmates have identical accents and carry the same size MacBook under their arms. In seminars, they express their opinions passionately and conduct impromptu debates. Unable to form such straightforward views or express them with any force, Connell initially felt a sense of crushing inferiority. The university counsellor asked about his sense of belonging. You used to say you felt trapped between two places, she said. Not really belonging at home, but not fitting in here either. Do you still feel that way? He just shrugged. The medication is doing its chemical work inside his brain now anyway, no matter what he does or says. He gets up and showers every morning. He turns up for work in the library. He doesn't really fantasize about jumping off a bridge. He takes the medication, life goes on. Connell's belonging or not belonging at Trinity College Dublin emerges as a central theme of normal people. While imagining with Verstenzer that university undergraduate days are remarkable and unique, particularly emotionally charged, yet fraught with promise and excitement, Rooney's novel is still sensitive to the reality that there are multiple reasons why students might not feel that they belong. From social or institutional barriers re disability to ongoing issues re racial or ethnic discrimination. And cutting across all of these issues are challenges relating to student well-being, given that adolescence and early adulthood is the peak time for the onset of mental health difficulties. In England and the UK, large-scale surveys have reported that one in five 16 to 24-year-olds now experience common mental health issues like depression and anxiety. The number of students disclosing mental health problems to the university is rapidly on the rise. In Ireland, the My World survey found that one in four 18 to 24-year-olds described feelings of depression and or anxiety in the severe or very severe range, with college and the future listed as the top two stressors in this age group. Record number of students are now accessing university counselling services with anxiety accounting for half of all such referrals. There has been a sharp increase also in cases of self-harm and identity issues and certainly post-COVID, the mental health crisis afflicting university campuses in the UK and Ireland shows no sign of abating. For Rooney's Connell, visits to the university counsellor are revelatory of the many strains on his own mental health with his undergraduate belonging or lack thereof being rooted at least partly in issues of social class. In the gilded and urbane environs of Trinity College, Connell feels suddenly self-conscious of his rural roots as well as his lack of financial privilege. His easy social positioning in secondary school has been radically upended by an entirely unfamiliar set of social mores. He feels alienated, inferior and lost. 
feelings all exacerbated by the suicide of a male friend at home in County Sligo. His girlfriend Marianne has slotted seamlessly into the privileged social scene of South County Dublin, but Connell's working class background suddenly seems to matter in ways he cannot fully comprehend. Now he has a sense of invisibility, nothingness, with no reputation to recommend him to anyone. Though his physical appearance has not changed, he feels objectively worse looking than he used to be. He has become self-conscious about his clothes. All the guys in his class wear the same waxed hunting jackets and plum-coloured chinos. Not that Connell has a problem with people dressing how they want, but he would feel like a complete prick wearing that stuff. At the same time, it forces him to acknowledge that his own clothes are cheap and unfashionable. His only shoes are an ancient pair of Adidas trainers, which he wears everywhere, even to the gym. Research by Keane and more recently Scanlon, Leahy, Jenkinson and Powell has underscored the manifold challenges faced by less privileged university students like Connell who struggle to find their footing in largely middle class environments. The social and relational aspects of university can be a major factor in their ability to succeed or not in the higher education sphere. The transition from secondary school to university is a difficult one for any undergraduate student. This is particularly so in the Irish context and I understand in the UK context too, where an emphasis on rote learning and high stakes final examination gives way very abruptly to pedagogical demands for critical and creative thought, often in the public and highly intimidating context of the university seminar or tutorial. In these contexts, self-confidence is paramount. It is somewhat of a shock for Connell to learn that his fellow students' expression of passionate opinion and inclination towards forceful debate is based <coughs> on little more than a highly superficial grasp of the assigned material. In Rooney's words, eventually he realised that most people were not actually doing the reading. In the very specific setting of the Humanities University seminar then, it seems that arrogance and hyperbole easily trump attentive silence, receptivity, or introspection. He understands now that his classmates are not like him. It's easy for them to have opinions and to express them with confidence. They don't worry about appearing ignorant or conceited. They are not stupid people, but they're not so much smarter than him either. They just move through the world in a different way, and he'll probably never really understand them, and he knows they will never understand him or even try. We might make a comparison here to the characters in Abortion, A Love Story. Flattery's writing has more deliberate antic humour than Rooney's, but the senses of alienation are similar. Here's Natasha. She was largely indifferent to her fellow students with their loud typing on computers and the ideas they communicated to each other in trembling voices. They all seemed to follow a strict code, and in the college coffee shop they outlined their secret philosophies passionately, huddled beneath heavy cardigans. What are you all talking about? Natasha wanted to scream. Ideas, ideas, ideas. She had no time for ideas. She wasn't raised with ideas. Or compared to Lucy in her seminar, she was performing expertly. She was adorable, except once in a seminar when she shouted, Jesus Christ, let me out of here. Who said that, Lucy? Her tutor asked. Beckett, she couldn't <laughs> risk a slip up like that again. So she began stuffing her ears with cotton wool, making it easier to agree with people by not listening to them. So Rooney is keen to underline that Connell's English literature degree is meaningful to him in ways not necessarily captured by the performativities instigated and rewarded by the university classroom. For Connell, an immersive engagement with literary fiction does provide a sanctuary of sorts. Books are at once a repository for his buried emotion and a reflection of the finer dimensions of his own sensibility. They illustrate how exactly he might communicate with those important to him when insight and intimacy seem like the greatest challenge of all. One night the library started closing just as he reached the passage in Emma when it seems like Mr Knightley is going to marry Harriet and he had to close the book and walk home in a state of strange emotional agitation. He's amused at himself getting wrapped up in the drama of novels like that but there it is, literature moves him. One of his professors calls it the pleasure of being touched by great art. It suggests to Connell that the same imagination he uses as a reader is necessary to understand real people also and to be intimate with them. Over the course of his four-year undergraduate degree, Connell, unlike Natasha and Lucy, does eventually achieve a sense of belonging. 
By his final year, he has a diverse group of friends, he is excelling academically, and he is editor of the College Literary Magazine. The, the disjunctions of social class, most notably between himself and Marianne, have gradually receded. But with the experiences of Rooney's as well as Flattery's characters in mind, one might argue that belonging at university is certainly not a given of the HE experience, no matter the promises of the university marketing department. Even with time and effort and no small amount of luck, it can be immensely challenging to, to develop a comfortable sense of self among others, a sense of home away from home. So moving towards a the conclusion then. I began this paper with the suggestion that higher education might be a place for the safe and the familiar. It can offer respite and refuge and belonging, a place for insiders and outsiders to come together and to forge meaningful and lasting bonds. But in making this argument and with the texts of Flattery and Rooney in mind, I suggest also that the university can be singularly alienating, troubling and disorientating. The university can challenge us, it can introduce us to the unexpected and it can unsettle all that we thought we knew. It is perhaps in this very conjunction of the strange and the familiar, the unheimlich as well as the homeliness, that the particular value of the university lies. Relatedly, Barnett and Bengtson have written recently of the university experience as one of detachment. On this understanding, higher education is a testing ground where many of his students previously held at attachments to their values, concepts, ideas or theories are up for discussion and debate. This does not mean that in the university arena all values and our ideas have to be surrendered, but it does point to a very deliberate mindset on the part of the individual student at least that no single attachment is or should be secure. Indeed, higher education is ultimately estrangement, detachment or semi-detachment. Higher education, in the author's words, quote, is an acceptance that any attempt to perceive the world, including the perceptual field in front of one, as well as mega objects that possess an inherent invisibility, such as globalization or climate change, has no security. There is always at least a lurking hesitancy such that one just does not know which concepts, ideas, values or frameworks on which to pin one's hopes. Thinking in similar terms of the university experience as an encounter with otherness, Edward Said has interestingly suggested that the ultimate model of the scholar is that of the migrant or the traveller. Such a figure is intellectually unencumbered and is more than willing to enter different worlds to embrace novelty and to cultivate an ongoing sense of emancipation. As scholars, we should be free to discover and travel among other selves, other identities, other varieties of the human adventure, writes Said, to use different idioms and understand a variety of disguises, masks and rhetorics. From the perspective of this paper then, the university is at once a site for safety and familiarity and a place where such senses are importantly challenged. It is a place for belonging and alienation. It is a place to cultivate the self and to open that traveling self to the other. As John Nixon phrases it in his reading of Hannah Arendt, the university is both a repository of received wisdom and informed opinion and the crucible within which such wisdom and opinion is to be challenged and endlessly critiqued. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.